because the pamphlet was this tiny. I'm going crazy trying to read it. So, so I said, I said, well, why don't I type it up? And I was only going to type it up for me. I, you know, I got selfish, I Actually, guess. Actually, here's your copy, Dave. And then, then <laughs> after I got done with the whole book, I says, boy, maybe they have something online. <laughs> guess what? They had something online. <laughs> so, and I decided, well, there's probably people in the church that, you know, are older, like me, that no. can't see. So I printed up some for large print. Uh, boy. Oh, I got it. I got it. Cool. Yay. <laughs> Disclaimer today. Disclaimer. I don't know how far we're getting in this, so it's just the way it is. If you, if you come up, you can have this copy free of charge. Yeah. Come on. You're a winner. We're all winners. <laughs> uh, it's like the price is right. Come on down. The price is paid. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, so I don't know how many weeks ago, even a month or more, that I started. Let me start off just by praying. May as well. It can help. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord God, it's, um, it's humbling, Lord God. It's an honor, Lord God, to stand here, Lord, in your presence in the presence of this church, the, the body, Lord God, that you've placed us in, Lord God. Father God, I ask you, Lord God, that every word that comes out of my mouth today, Lord God, is edifying, Lord God. It's from you, Lord. And Father God, I ask you, Lord, to give us ears to hear, Lord God, and eyes to see, Lord God, what you are doing, Lord, in the spirit. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. All right, so I wasn't, I was wanting to jump right into this. Um, the Harness of the Lord, it's written by Bill Britton. For anybody that wants to download a copy for themselves, www.promiseseed.com. Um, so anyway, I just want to commend Brother Barry. I know he's not here. Um, what a marvelous job he did on the Feast of Tabernacles. Whew. Right, I mean, that's a book, and look at how long it went on. It was, it was absolutely wonderful. So that, this ties into the Harness of the Lord. So what I want to do is, I'm going to read a couple of the last chapters out of this book to give a little groundwork for the harness of the Lord. Um, we all know that God's word is an eternal word. And when God's word is given to somebody, whether it be in a vision or a dream or a prophetic word or a reading, Page, uh, the words jump off the pages like Brother Stephen was saying. You could never really understand that, you know. Maybe when you first heard it, you're reading, and you may have read, uh, read this thing a hundred times, you know, and then all of a sudden, one day, the Spirit of the Lord jumps all over you, and all of a sudden, the pages come alive. The living, written epistle. So it's, it's absolutely incredible how that happens. All right, so I'm going to put on the cheaters, the reading glasses, because otherwise 
my arm is no longer long enough <laughs> for me to read. <laughs> no, but my arm is too short that it cannot save my vision. <laughs> so, so anyway, this is out of the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, so I'm going to start, like I said, I'm only going to read a couple, maybe two or three paragraphs, and then and that'll be it. So it's called Rivers of Living Water. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye, shall ye not, see, now I'm getting all, shall ye not know it? That's a question mark. I will even make a way in the wilderness and, des and rivers in the desert. Isaiah 43, 19. We thank God for the taste we have had from the fountain of living water. But Jesus promised, the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Sad to say, we have been like a fountain in the song of songs, a shut up, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. I believe that to an extent, but I, I see that, I see the uncapping of the wells and the digging of the wells going on in every time I come into this church, every time I come to a church service, I can see in certain individuals the well of life that's in them that, that's springing up. Um, it's, it's the way it has to be. Because how else, how else is his word going to go forth? How else are we going to walk in the midst of what goes on around us in this day and age? Um, and people need to hear what we have to say when God has us to say it. A fountain, but shut up, sealed, frozen over. Abraham digged many good wells in his day, but after his death, we are told that the Philistines had filled them in. Isaac found he had to dig them again before he could take advantage of the refreshing waters that lay buried underneath the rocks and dirt and filth which the enemy had tossed into the wells. And I don't know about you guys, but that enemy that lives in between these two ears and up here. Um, sometimes we allow the dirt to get in there and, and you know, yeah. and if we allow it in too long, it tends to stop that well. Yeah. So it is so it is with the Church of Christ and the fountain which Christ has created in the hearts of his people. All the potentialities of this new life and this new experience are right in our heart, locked up like the germ life in the seed, and therefore we profit nothing. The corn of wheat, and we, I know we've heard Brother Barry read this, but it's never grievous to, to hear it again corn of wheat must die. Is it not written, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Everything that God is, the all in all of God was in the seed, was in Jesus Christ. So when we have Jesus Christ living in here, we have all the same things. So we can't bring forth any other fruit other than what God has planted in us. The setting of this beautiful statement, Andrew and Philip had just come to the Lord that certain Greeks had requested to see Jesus. And this was the Lord's astonishing reply. Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. Strange reply, but not hard to understand when we begin to realize that Jesus shall appear and shall be seen in his people through his cross and resurrection. We would see 
Jesus, said the Greeks. So they came requesting to see Jesus, okay? Then they must see him in the harvest which his death would bring into being. They must see him in the grain that would be reproduced after his very likeness in his very image. They would see him in his people. The only way that we, as the people of God, are going to manifest the life and resurrection power of Christ is by becoming identified with him in his cross. So really, <laughs> this kind of goes along with what's going to happen today, right over there in that corner. That might be a little corner of this earth here, but there's more power going to happen over there today than one could ever imagine. It's not sufficient that we merely accept Christ in his finished work for us. Doing that, we are saved, but abide alone. We must share his sufferings, identify ourselves with his cross so that it actually becomes our very own. And then we shall rise in resurrection life to bring forth much fruit unto the kingdom. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Well, that's... That's all I'm going to read out of the book, out of the Feast of the Tabernacles. I think Barry did a marvelous job. And there's still, it doesn't really matter how many times we read stuff out of books or out of the Word of God. We're always going to get a little more, always. Pop. I just want to know if I can say a little bit about what went on yesterday, or did you have something you were going to say? Okay, so so yesterday my nephew Daniel Lefebvre got married, and um, Brother Bud was asked to speak. So <laughs> we know when Brother Bud is asked to speak, you, you're going to get something. That's right. Yeah, it was even better than E.F. Hutton. You had people from all walks of life, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, it was uh, not a conventional matrimony, we'll put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it sure was not. And it was unfortunate and that's the heartbreaking reality of what goes on out in the world. I, when we have weddings in, in the body of Christ, in the church, it's, it's definitely heart touching and heartfelt and God ordained. And uh, so anyway, so Brother Bud had two pages and I won't get into everything that he said. All I can tell you is that extremely anointed, okay? The anointing was all over him, coming out of him and the, and the pages that he had written down really were words of life. They were words of wisdom, words of encouragement, words of instruction, warning not not stern warning but if you if you take what he said and and let it sink in there's a wisdom in the learning aspect of what he said but i just i looked at my nephew daniel who was who, who had uh, in the beginning of his life, surrounded by spiritual goodness. Um, and then as a young adult, late teen, he went in his own direction. God still has a call on him. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. And there's basically 
a call on the whole family as whether we whether we as individuals take heed to that and when God says come if we come if we say yes Lord that's the beginning but anyway um, it wasn't it wasn't 30 seconds into what Brother Bud said, and I can see, I can literally see the conviction over my nephew. So, does anyone have the handheld mic? Sister Byrne. Not to brag for Brother Bud, but I will tell you something. No, not, no, this is not a brag. This is not a brag. This is. We can't hear you. More people came up to him afterwards. I, I could not believe it. More people came to him and said, whatever you said, everything you said was so touching and so wonderful. I passed out more tissue. I'm telling you the truth. I passed more tissue out to people yesterday than you could even, I'm not kidding. <laughs> whatever, you know, what he's talked about touched very many people and that made me happy because I know 90% of them were not saved. 90% of them probably didn't even know the Lord, but you know what? Those words didn't just go floating in the air. We, right. They, people were coming up to our table and just saying whatever that, that speech you gave, Pastor Tim, that speech you gave, uh, microphone, <laughs> that speech you gave was really, it really, really touched me. See, the anointing of God, it doesn't matter where you are, who's in your midst, it's the anointing of God that will break yokes. Whether they're permanently broken or not, I know that God planted some kind of a seed yesterday. It, and it all depends on the ground. How ready was that ground? And did that seed, what's going to happen to that seed? Is it going to take root? Did it fall on stony ground? You know the parable. Pastor Tim? He just said it. The anointing. And as God's people and as God's representative, when you walk in the spirit, it isn't the words you speak. It's what God speaks through you because of the anointing that is allowed to come into people's hearts and bring the conviction. Now, whether they respond on it, that's up to them. That's not on you. That's right. That's not on us. That's on the Holy Ghost and them, whether they respond to him or not, right? Our issue is, is whether we hear the voice of God, we represent God in his righteousness, and we speak as God speaks through us, not just speaking words, but because of the anointing. That's what all last week was all about, dealing with the anointing, because the anointing is put on God's people for a purpose. And the purpose of the anointing is to break the yokes, to break the hindrances, but is also to bring us in as a people, as a family, into the fullness of who God is. It brings relationship. This way first, then this way. That's right. And then it brings the family together as one. As Jesus said, I and the Father. That's the way it works. And what God does when he gets a hold of a man and is able to use that vessel to speak, you think God cares who's around? Absolutely. He not. knows those that are there, that are there, wherever it is. That's why Brother Tim always says to you, Lord, in your words. God shoots you. <laughs> That's right. And it's because he put a deposit in each. This is, this, is good, this is good teaching right here for all of us. See, we think sometimes we speak words and it doesn't affect people. You never know what it affects people. And what we worry about, we, we get hung up on if, 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 they, if they respond right away. Well, guess what? It may not respond for a long time. And God is patient. Yes, he is. <laughs> there it is, Sister Fran. The word will not come back void. 
got to do. The word will do exactly what God sent it forth to do. And all he's looking for when it comes to us, willing vessels, to have an ear that's pierced through the master's voice and will only speak what he speaks. On that note, <laughs> on that note, before she gets the mic, <laughs> God had everybody's, at that point, God had everybody's undivided attention because it, it was at that point of the wedding, the, the marriage, uh, within the confines of renewing, um, exchanging vows that he was able to, that God was able to use Brother Bud. Brother Bud was the willing vessel. Brother Bud said yes. <laughs> Sister Barbara. <laughs> well, we all know that words are very important. Extremely important, you know, brings about death or life. But this is what words do. They produce thought. They produce thought. That's right. When you've heard something, when you've heard something that you've never heard before, like Sister Barbara said, that's thought provoking. Mm -hmm. So people get a chance to ponder on that. I just wanted to say one more thing, I promise. Um, the first person that came up to him was the owner of the place. All right, first of all, it, it's, it's called the farm because well, it, it is, is a farm. Um, <laughs> It's in Enfield, Connecticut, but he was the first one to come to Bud. When we first went, got there in the morning or early afternoon, you know, he had, uh, the, the, the owner had uh, jeans on and a t cap and, you know. Well, then when he came to me, he, he was all dressed up with a suit and everything, and I said to him, who is that? He goes, I don't know. Well, I ended up, we found out it was the owner. His name is Jim. Well, he was crying. He was crying. But at the end of the night, we were getting ready to leave, and, and uh, him and Bud and uh, Craig were, were talking about something. Then I, then I met them at the car, and uh, I said, he's a really nice person. And I said to him, I said, you know what? I said, um, we're going to pray for you and pray for your business and pray that God will just bless you. And he said, well, how about if we pray right now? And he cried. Brother Stephen, back there. I thought I saw. You're good? Okay. And where was I? Lord. Oh. I just wanted to say, because you're, you were talking about, uh, I just want to say you were talking about the anointing, and, and um, sometimes I'm not even thinking that way. I'm just thinking I'm out with someone, and God made a way for me to, to have, to have um, fellowship with someone or just to be able to share with someone. But I, excuse me, the other day I um, was able to go with my husband's aunt. She took, she was our photographer at our wedding here, and um, she's in a Catholic church, and she started talking to me, and I just listened. I, I said to her, I'm just going to listen. I'm going to remember, you know, you don't have, have to say something, just listen. So I'm listening, and she's really letting, you know, letting her heart pour out to me. And then she says to me, she said, I said, um, as she finished, I said, you know, I said, we have an adult Sunday school. I said, and I really, really enjoy it. I said, um, what I like about it, I said, is that, you know, whoever is going to be teaching, you know, they, they've prayed and they've asked God, this is, this is what you give me to pray to, to teach. <clears throat> I said, but the wonderful thing is, I said, there's always an opportunity. If you, when you raise your hand, I said, if you want to be able to contribute, you just say, you know, I have something I'd like to share. She looked at me and she said to me, now that's what we need in our church. We need one of those. I'm going to have to talk to the priest. <laughs> oh, Lord. Hey, like, brother, like Pastor Tim said, you know, <laughs> we're the arrow, okay? And God shoots us out of, he shoots us. And I don't think God ever... Do you think God's such a bad shot that he ever missed his target? <laughs> you know, hearing things like this isn't a surprise. It shouldn't surprise us at all. Especially the day and the hour that we live in, I really believe that there's um, 
a lot of vulnerable people out there. They're looking for something. See, we don't know from the time they were born if they had a grandmother or a mother, somebody praying for them. And it's all about the timing. And I'm listening to all these things, but this is just seed crop. You don't even know how much seed has been planted in that ground. But one day when somebody comes by to water it, it's going to begin to, and I can't help it. Maybe I'm crazy, but I believe we're going to see revivals. We're going to see awakenings in, the, in these days. We're living in the greatest, one of the greatest days that we can live in. Because this whole world, they're in such confusion. And we're, what are we called to be? We're called to be the light. That's right. We've been crying out that God would raise us up as a light. This church has been called to be a city set on a hill. So, this doesn't surprise me. No. We are going to see so much. I really believe transition. I keep hearing that over and over again, that this whole church is in transition. There, there's good. I see so much good. We've, it's like we've only just begun. You know, I mean, it's amazing. It's so amazing. I'm so excited. You know, it's like there's just something. And you know what? We just have to be willing. We have to become the very willing sacrifice that God has called us to become. We have to say, I have to laugh because we have to say, yes, Lord. That's what we have to do, Every you know, day. because we're going to see. You know what? And I have to laugh because sometimes I'll go around the house and I'll be praying and, you know, and all of a sudden, you know how the Lord just pops these little things into your mind. And it's like, I remember one time the word of the Lord was, and they're not going to look like you. And they're not going to act like you. So what if they come in with 50 million tattoos or, or they were a, um, addicts or we have unwed mothers or we have all these things? We have to be ready because the Lord's after them as much as they are as he is after us. And we have to be prepared. So nothing, none of this surprises me because I'm telling you, it's going to be a place where people are going to run to. Because that's going to be the very place where they're going to get their strength and their hope. And we have to be ready for that. We are basically, we're more than... We are more than we think we are sometimes, okay? Not in the proud sense, okay? Not, not in the haughtiness, not in the haughty spirit, but, you know, very humbling. And Sister Irene touched right on, you know, they're not going to look like what you think they're going to look like. Um, we got a new hire at my shop, a young man. His name is Daniel. He kind of had a hard life growing up. Um, lost both of his parents by the time he was 16. Um, had issues with things, you know, um, covered in tattoos. Had an experience with God. So, you know, God lets you meet people. You know what I'm saying on a daily basis face to face, you never know who you're going to run into, you never know who God's going to put in your path, you never know how God, which direction you're going in when God shoots you out of that bow. Um, he, had, he said he's born again, so I knew there was something different about him, but born again didn't really, yes, born again in one respect, but he wasn't born again in the water of baptism. So. I was talking to him for a little bit, and, you know, I said, you have initial salvation. You, you know, you've accepted God. I said, but that, that is just a taste. That is like a drop of water in a whole ocean. I said, that's, that's a great beginning, you know, but there's, there's not a firm foundation for him yet. We, keep, we can keep praying for him because, you know, I know that God's got that hook in his jaw. 
and he's still kind of running on the end of that line, you know, but eventually you're going to run out of line, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you can only go so far. That is so true. You can only go, you, you can only go so far before there's nowhere to go. But I think, you know, he realizes that. And I'm, I'm glad Sister Irene said that, you know. And I know there's no, we are so rich in here in the Word of God, in Revelation, in what God's poured into us. You know, if there is a famine out there for the hearing of the word of the Lord, we are the storehouse. I want to let you know. Because God's been storing his deposit. His deposit's been building up. Um, and there's, exactly, and there is, we have, let's put it this way. If, if somebody comes in here with, as a willing vessel with a, an open heart, so to speak, and they come in here hungry, I guarantee they're getting fed. Because when you come into, when you come into the Lord's buffet, okay, there's something, there's such a spread you're going to find something that you can feed on. Uh, all right, so just for the sake of this, can some, how many people were here when I started to do this? A, I don't know, a month ago? <laughs> all right, so not a whole, not everybody. Um, so this was a little tract written. I. I'm thinking around 1980 by Brother Bill Britton. It's called The Harness of the Lord. And we used to have it on the shelf back there. And it was just this little pamphlet. And I, I read it years and years ago. And then um, kind of my interest got sparked um, back into this. So. Uh, don't know whatever happened to the tract. I, it was good to be able to find it online. Um, but I believe that this is, this is something that is good and relevant for everybody that is serving the Lord and those who are going to. Um, what time do we got? I'm just... Uh, only because I'm not going to be here next Sunday, and I don't know how much into this 1035. So, but you know what? I, I've got I've got five minutes to. Okay, so that's why I was kind of trying to not really stall because God God is in control. God knows what He's doing. So whether whether I crack into even talking about this today. Maybe, <laughs> but this is what, when I come back from vacation, this will be what we're, uh, we're studying out of. So God did give me something else today. <laughs> I, I've been reading this book written by Lamar Boschman. It's called A Heart of Worship. It's a good book. When I first got it, I don't, I might have just, breezed through the pages and glanced at it, but I never really read it to the point of the words jumping off the page. So I'm just going to read a, a paragraph here, and, um, and that'll be it for, <clears throat> for today. All right, so... This is what he wrote in the book. And again, it's, it's really not new revelation to those of us who have been serving the Lord for any length of time. It's called Wholehearted Worship. He starts out by saying, when I fell in love with my wife, I spent every moment of the day thinking about and planning for her. 
when we were together. So this is, basically this is a romance. This is a kind of romance that God wants to have with us. I spent every moment of the day thinking about and planning for her. When we were together, it seemed as if we were the only two people on earth. And for, I remember when I was young, <laughs> ger, younger and in love, and, and, and the courtship was happening with my wife and I. And uh, <laughs> I wasn't savvy enough to give away part of my heart and keep part for myself. I gave it all to her. That's what God wants out of us. He doesn't want, well, Lord, you know, I love you with three quarters of my heart. Uh, <laughs> he gave his heart to us. That's right. He gave us his all. She had my focus, my attention, and my heart. We hugged and held hands as often as we could. We spent as much time as we could together. Our expressions of affection were not mechanical or dutiful, but packed with feeling and meaning. We were focused intensely on each other. Jesus described this kind of love when the scribe asked him, what is the foremost commandment? And Jesus answered with a question. So Je this is what Jesus does. This is what he, all the time, he answers the question with a question to get the people to ponder and think. So the lawyer replied, well, he said, what does the law say, okay? The lawyer replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength, Mark 12 and 30. Jesus told the lawyer he was correct. That's always kind of love. It's not long, ongoing love, but all complete, all total and complete love. It's the first commandment of the old covenant and the greatest commandment of the new covenant. Let's look at the four ways. Well, I guess, you know what? The point is this. The point is that with the heart of worship, that's where worship starts. It starts in our heart. It starts in the heart of man. It starts in the heart of the Lord. And then it, it gets expressed outward. Um, I'm going to end it here. I'm, you know, because if what good is two or three minutes of this going to do? I just want to encourage Ronnie and, and encourage us, you know. Sunday school in some places is, is governed by words on a page and what they say and where that's got its place. Sunday school is really discussing what the Spirit does. We probably learned more here today than if somebody read some pages on a book. But I want to go back to yesterday. The farm is on the far side of Enfield, Connecticut. It's a piece of property cleared about three quarters of what this yard is. You drive by it, you can drive by it because it's just a farmhouse and then this big clearing. And there's cornfields to the right and to the left. Set back on the property is an unbelievable platform stage with lighting tracks and a sound system. It's as big as this platform, easy. And they have, they have entertainment there. They have uh, cookouts, he calls them. Uh, the owner, when we first showed up, was still getting things ready. He had his jeans on and a T-shirt, smoking a cigar, and had his cap on. And, and I, you know, talked to him for a minute. What a beautiful spot it is. It, had, it was just done up really, really well. And, and the tables around where you could 
where we were going to eat afterwards. Um, so Danny has played there a number of times and knew the owner. And, uh, and the owner, in respect to the wedding, he got dressed in a suit just so he could function around there. And uh, after the vows, or just before the vows were exchanged, I was called up to say a few words. When it was all done and the wedding procession was marching back to greet everybody, uh, the, the owner of the place was standing just waiting for me. And he grabbed my hand and he said, that was the best thing I've ever heard. And I said, oh, thank you. And a couple other people, you know, uh, it was amazing. That we, my, I was crying, blah, blah, blah. I got, out of 100 people, I probably got 25 people came to me. <clears throat> the end of the night, after the band was up there playing and whatever and we're leaving, the owner uh, was out at the parking lot and I stopped to say goodnight to him. And he just, again, reiterated how much, he said, I got it on tape. <laughs> and he started to spill his guts to me about the relationship he's been in for eight years and it was coming to nothing and it's falling apart. And, and he just, you know, the, the, the city, I don't think he's in it for the money. He was in it just because he loves people. And, and he wanted to be part of something. And uh, I don't know how it got to that point. Bernadette showed up and, and Craig, who was uh, the father, not Daniel's father, but his stepfather. Sort of. And this guy spilt his guts out to me and, and we started to talk. And, and, you know, he's saying all of the problems with the town, trying to stop him and, and whatever, bugging him. But by the time we were leaving, we we're in an embrace. He's crying on my shoulder. We're like friends from the beginning of time. Yeah. And uh, it just made us feel so welcome and you know we just it's not something that happens every weekend but a half a dozen times during the year they'll have a a picnic or a family gathering or something you know but uh, but what a venue there was it was perfect it was beautiful and uh, and when we prayed for this guy he just fell apart and was so thankful and so grateful and welcomed the prayers. I mean, he just, he just swallowed them up. And uh, so you never know the situation God puts you in until you walk away from it sometime. 